Greetings, friends of liberty. In this trailer, I'm going to be briefly describing 10 mistakes that Carl Benjamin, also known as Sargon of Akkad, makes, taken from two recent interviews, as a case study for what happens to a person with an excellent mind who abandons the greatest political philosophy mankind has yet devised, classical liberalism. Let there be no mistake, Carl has given it up, explicitly in his own words. At the 9 minute 11 second mark of the Zuby interview, Zuby asks, I know that years ago for sure you used to call yourself a classical liberal. Do you still consider yourself that? Carl answers, I'm definitely a conservative now. So let's go to mistake number one. Explaining why he believes the classically liberal conception of freedom fails, he says, beginning around the 1030 mark, if you turn it into a doctrine from John Locke or Rousseau or whoever, then you get hard edges to it. We have to be free in all circumstances, and anything that infringes on freedom is immoral even if it's necessary. So what's an example of this? <clears throat> he says the freedom to transition is not something that we should extend to children, but according to the doctrine of liberalism, infringing on freedom is always bad. A normal person says there have to be practical limits. Ergo, classical liberalism fails. But does it? First, parents support children with their income and property, so they get first choice in deciding, not some woke bureaucrat. But secondly, in the case of woke parents who would transition their children, this would be a physical abuse of the child's property rights, just like presently Muslim society sometimes does by cutting off girls' clitorises. And so, since no parent has the right to physically damage a child's property in their body, classical liberalism obviously would outlaw a child's guardians from cutting off a girl's breasts or any other transitioning procedure. But thirdly, in the case of a post-pubescent, independently wealthy, 15-year-old Bill Gates, then in that case, he would have the right to decide if he could find a doctor in a classical liberal society to do it. Mistake number two. At the 740 mark of the Zuby interview, Carl says, since World War II, liberal ideology has become the dominant ideology of the West. They, the liberals, can't tell any qualitative difference between kinds of people. The Danes keep good stats on this and they've found that certain immigrants are not net tax contributors, so they don't actually pay for themselves. We brought in millions and millions of these people who are actually a burden economically to our country. And we keep bringing them in more and more and more. Unsurprisingly, we're sinking down and becoming poorer and poorer and poorer. We'll just bankrupt ourselves, shall we? This is Carl's major explanation for why Britain is slowly going bankrupt. It's the immigrants. First note that he doesn't cite a percentage for how many immigrants are unproductive. Is it 10 percent, 50, 80? Secondly, the greatest and most extensive test ever run for whether uncontrolled immigration can work was the U.S. from 1850 to 1924. About 30 million migrants came in, and overall, despite the fact that millions were Irish, it was a huge success. And why was it, Carl? Why did it work? Because during this time, the U.S. was a classically liberal country. What do you know? No welfare state to support unproductive migrants. No drug war so they can get black market employment. Free market health care and a real estate market, both of which expanded automatically to meet their needs. No public education or much of it to indoctrinate students with a multiculturalism that pretends all immigrant groups are equal. No hate speech laws preventing one from criticizing immigrant behavior. And a police and judiciary that enforced the criminal code. Strange. Classical liberalism worked perfectly. Mistake number three. At about 556, Carl says, the institutions of Britain are the same institutions from the British Empire. There was never a break between them and a new order. But that's completely false. The institutions of Britain have completely changed from overwhelmingly private to public in the last 100 to 150 years in healthcare, education, philanthropy, energy, transportation, and the size of the administrative state. Mistake 
Number four. At the 1530 mark of the Zuby interview, Carl says, the language you use, there's differences in thought patterns between like the French, the Germans, and the English. The French and the Germans, their sentences are entirely back to front. Well, that affects the kinds of things you can think. And so these differences are very, very deep. They're not irrelevant in any way, shape, or form. They really matter. What Carl outlines here has traditionally been called the Warfian hypothesis. And in its strong form, has been shown false for many decades by linguists. In its weak form, perhaps slightly true, but there's no reason to think it's deep or long-term or irrevocable. So, as we will see in his next mistake, Carl wants to build a theory of ethnicity that makes different ethnicities irrevocably fundamentally different, but on this score, he fails. Mistake number five. Starting at the 3650 mark of the gold interview, Carl says, English is an ethnicity, so you can't just become English. We're the ethnicity that's produced by the Anglo-Saxon and the Celts. English only comes from England. Any ethnic identity is like this. You inherit from your parents from previous generations. It has to be that your parents had that as well. You have to have English parents to be English. This is not complex. Let's imagine an Italian, grows up in Naples, becomes a great actor, 30 or moves to Britain. And at 40, he not only absorbed English culture in general, but the accents and dialects and regional peculiarities of many different regions. So he can go on stage and become a Liverpudlian, accent and all, a Scotsman, a Welshman, a Londoner, and an Ulsterman. Everyone would agree when he's on the stage that he becomes those people even more completely than they are on average. But then, when off the stage, back in Naples, if he wants to become Italian again, he can. It's purely his choice, Carl. He has many ethnic options. So does ethnicity necessarily have anything to do with genetics? No. Lineage? No. Parents? No. All it is is the culture of a group. And if you absorb enough elements of that culture, you become them, whether they accept you or not. Mistake number six. When describing his belief about the formation of ethnicity, he says, starting around the 4240 mark of the gold interview, it's not rational. We be self-made autonomous men. It's like, okay, but that's not real. No one's a self-made autonomous man. You're from somewhere. You've inherited a bunch of attributes from that place. You've inherited cultural norms, a history. You are that thing before you're a rational adult, and you can't get rid of it. It's like your height. It's like your eye color. That's not to say a person can't join the tribe. True? Barak Spinoza was one of the greatest philosophers of the Enlightenment, a leading, path-breaking thinker who attracted brilliant minds from all around Europe. And he became this precisely because he was, believe it or not, Carl, a self-made autonomous man who rejected many of the cultural and intellectual attributes of his Jewish community, who chose to be a man of the Enlightenment, an almost atheistic pantheist, and it was thus rejected and thrown out of his Jewish community. Sure, we're not born autonomous, Carl, but for all practical purposes, we can become autonomous. Mistake number seven. Carl believes that fascism was really just a strand of communism. In 1640, the Gold Interview, he says, there were three different ideological strands that broke out of communism. The first one is Fabianism, which was the British, particularly English, method. The second one was Lenin's vanguardism. And the third was actually fascism. The fascist Mussolini and Gentili recognized that socialism was a dead doctrine. So conceived of the next step in socialism, essentially a national socialism, because socialism up to that time had been conceived as an international socialism. About 15% true. Wherever fascists appeared in Europe from the First World War on, their main driving ideology was nationalism. Fascism is actually a strand of nationalism, not communism, Mr. Traditionalist. If we go through Stanley Payne's magisterial History of Fascism, 1914 to 1945, we see, for example, that in Italy, socialists were there in the beginning with Gentile and Mussolini, but as the movement grew stronger and larger, it was taken over by nationalists. Squads of fascisti killed the politician Mattiotti in 1924, causing a huge scandal. And among the thousands of others they killed, 
they killed many socialists. Similarly, in Germany, there were many nationalist organizations, groups, or parties, from the Freikorps to the Stahlhelm to the German Nationalist People's Party. And what were the main electoral themes of the Nazis? As Payne says, nationalism, economic salvation, and anti-communism. Gang fights occur between Nazis and communists, though the Nazis also sometimes attack socialists who were much more reluctant to engage in violence than the communists. As to other fascist movements, there was the Legion of the Archangel Michael, a.k.a. the Iron Guard, founded in Romania in 1927 by Codre Nu. Its motto was, everything for the country. There was little or no socialistic influence. So no, Carl, fascism comes from the right. Mistake number eight. At 6.30 of the Zubi interview, focusing on immigrants again, he says, we're now providing an international health care service and not a national health care service. This is why the NHS is failing. There are 11 million people on the waiting list. Now, I'm personally not against the NHS if it were restricted to people who were born in Britain. No, all you've got to do, Carl, is read John Goodman's National Healthcare in Great Britain, published way back in 1980, or James Bartholomew's The Welfare State We're In, published in 2002, which I reviewed here to see how inefficient the NHS already was with free at the point of delivery care, attracting lots of people who weren't sick. You can also see the huge and unnecessary amount of administrative staff, and you can see how little they invested in capital equipment like dialysis machines and CAT scanners. The NHS, created by the communist Aaron Bevan and the Labour Party, which sang the Red Anthem to start Parliament in 1945, has been a failure from day one, even though then England had almost no immigrants. Mistake number nine. At about the 4350 mark of the Zuby interview, Carl says, taking, talking about life priorities. It should be relationships first, the way you treat your family, your friends, your neighbors. They are your relationships and they are the most important thing about your life. The entire good of human life comes from the quality of your relationships. Is this true? Well, much as I hate to quote him, Freud, to the contrary, said it much better and more succinctly. Love and work, work and love, that's all there is. And going in quite different directions, the novelist and philosopher Ayn Rand said, happiness is that state of consciousness which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. If a man values productive work, his happiness is the measure of his success in the service of his life. So I'm going with Sigmund and Ayn on this one. Productive work and happy relationships are both necessary for happiness. Dr. Benjamin, notwithstanding. Finally, mistake number 10. Zuby starts talking about the state of male-female relationships and at the 11, at the 1, 16, 20 mark says, young men are not happy. Young women are disillusioned and unhappy. You hear talk about a crisis of masculinity where do we even start with this man? Carl replies, would you like an extreme solution to this? Ban birth control. That's what this requires. All of this is a product of birth control. I'm not saying we should ban birth control, but that's the only way all of this gets solved. If young men can have sex without any consequences, then what's the incentive to be in a relationship? First, forget about the pill. Are you going to allow us at least French letters, Carl? Please? Secondly, you can't go back in time, Carl, as much as you traditionists would like to. Both birth control and nuclear weapons are here to stay. Thirdly, difficulties with male-female relationships are actually caused by the vast increase in rights violations, among which are public schooling, which runs boys down, the legal system, which privileges women throughout many institutions and in divorce and custody courts, and by the general decrease in morality caused by the fact that the private sector and civil society is much smaller and weaker than it used to be before the 60s. So in conclusion, what's relevant politically is the best of what's British. In political philosophy, John Locke and his classical liberalism. And so while Karl talks about all the many gifts like British, his British ancestors that they gave him and the debt he owes them, quite ironically, He's discarded one of their greatest gifts, classical liberalism. 
So what relevance, again, does being British have? What actually matters is whether you're Zulu or Icelandic or Argentinian or American, do you believe in protecting property rights or not? That's classical liberalism and its greatness. I bid you well and remain a very classically liberal Scarlet Pimpernel.